next section is section eight, twins and breach. What if you need to deliver twins or a breech baby? There are definitely some important factors to consider in this case that we'll learn. And section eight will give you some confidence if you're faced with either one of these pretty dire situations. We will again role play with our dolls and we'll have some videos that we will uh, give the URL to those who are remote at this time. We're going to talk a little bit about um, twins and breaches. Okay, we have one twin in the room. <laughs> there can be two types of twins. One is that it is one egg that splits, okay, and I have a set of twins that way. They are mirror image. And the other is if there's two eggs, in other words, the woman ovulates on both sides at the same time, um, two babies are uh, in the works. Now, some families genetically, this runs in their family, okay? that the women ovulate doubly on both sides. And, and so uh, the families are used to twins. Also, there are uh, areas in Africa wh where there are a lot of twins born. And supposedly, it's in an uh, area where they eat a, wild, a lot of wild yam, OK? And that supposedly triggers a uh, double ovulation. When I was pregnant with my twins, we were in Indiana. My husband was going to grad school at Indiana University and in Bloomington. And there was a family, we lived in student housing. There was a family that lived down at the end of our complex. And they were from Africa. And they had three sets of twins. And he walked by me one day. He said, you know you're carrying twins. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. <laughs> we'll see. And sure enough, I was, OK. Probably 50% of twins were missed by doctors, by the medical profession, before ultrasound. If a woman hasn't had an ultrasound during her pregnancy, she may have missed it. I, I have missed a set of twins uh, before, maybe a couple, OK? <laughs> Uh, one of them, it was one of my old clients, and she came in very late at the very end of her pregnancy, and she didn't know when she got pregnant. And so, do you know what I mean? I just assumed she was further ahead than what she really was. And so, she um, went into labor. I went out, and uh, here comes the baby and it was too small i mean it was it was fine but it wasn't as big as what she was okay i thought oh my <laughs> got it uh there has to be another one in there <laughs> so yeah got out my doppler and found the other baby and and so forth and um uh i thought uh well this is really interesting i ended up transporting the babies in to the hospital, they were fine, but actually one of them, I, I felt w had a little bit of respiratory distress. Actually, it had quite a bit. I bagged it, okay? I went in the ambulance, bagged the baby on the way to the hospital, but the baby was fine, ended up being fine. Uh, this was years ago, but um, I watched on uh, YouTube a, a twin delivery there's one on there where they didn't know it was twins, and it, it took a long time <laughs> for them to figure out that there was another baby there. But if a baby comes out and it's really small, <laughs> you ought to poke around and see what else you can find in there and see if there, there is another baby. When mothers are <coughs> pregnant, how do you feel about moms having ultrasounds? Because now, if they ever find anything, it's like they're doing an ultrasound every other week on the mom, on the baby. And I, I just, I don't know how you felt about that, whether you thought that it was good practice or not. You know, I think that uh, an ultrasound can be a, a wonderful thing uh, in certain cases, but not necessarily for all women or need them. Generally, I don't advise ultrasound till 30 weeks. I think at 30 weeks the baby is more mature and so they can handle ultrasound a lot better. Um, 
you know, I don't know about studies and so forth. Um, there used to be some things that they wondered um, about the safety of ultrasound, but babies handle it better when they are more mature. Because if you watch a baby during ultrasound, they try to get away from it, okay? And little boys have erections. That's why it's easier to tell what sex they are. Do you know what I mean? Because their little doodad is sticking up there. Uh, is it but sensitive to the waves? What? It's sensitive to the waves that are being Yeah, taken uh, they're sensitive to the waves, okay? And so I think it's better if they're older. But for instance, I had a mother, a wonderful mother, who I couldn't pick up a heart tone um, yet and she had had a miscarriage about that stage in pregnancy and so she went and got an ultrasound and to find out if the baby was still alive and sure enough it was and that was just wonderful. That psychologically is so important and sometimes I, if I pick up early that someone's carrying twins, I like them to go verify it because that makes a difference on what, what they're going to so how they're going to supplement and take care of themselves during pregnancy. But generally speaking, um, 30 weeks is a good time to find out. So back to the twins, okay? And so we have a set of twins that are identical, okay? Identical, and they can be in one amniotic sac. Not necessarily. It depends on how fast they split, how fast <coughs> the egg splits, okay? but they can be in one amniotic sac. If they are, and you know, like if you went into um, a woman who was in labor with twins, she would probably know, yes, we had an ultrasound and the babies are in one sac. If they are, well, they have to be the same sex, okay? Even if she says they're the same sex, then you need to be careful with this, okay? And that is if the cord is around the neck of the first baby that comes out, it could actually be the cord of the other baby. Mm -hmm. And so you would not want to cut it and clamp it, okay? Cl clamp it and cut it the other way around, okay? So uh, because you'd be cutting off the baby that's in the womb. And it is the second baby that usually is the hardest the second baby is usually the hardest and has the more trouble because what happens when one baby comes out? Their environment has changed, okay? And so the second twin can be in trouble. I like, personally, the second twin to be birthed really fast. In my set of twins, the second one came um, in seven minutes after the first one. And I had them in the hospital. I had them vaginally. It was back when you could feel, still find some doctors that would do it. Um, and my second, the first one was head down. That's what you want with a set of twins. Number one, head down. Number two, she was actually a footling breach. And what the doctor did was he pushed her legs back up and she came as a complete breach. Now there's three kinds of breaches. There's Frank with the legs straight up, and we saw that, okay? And there's foot lean with one or two feet down here, and then there's a complete in which they come out butt, mainly butt, like that. So anyway, um, <coughs> he, he did it that way. I think twins, if they get to four weeks to their due date, they should be fine. In other words, they stimulate each other, uh, in the womb, they're close to each other. Um, four weeks to due date is fine. If they're earlier than that, in an emergency situation, you're going to be dealing with um, premature babies. And <coughs> in that case, you want to have the mother carry the babies inside of her clothes next to her skin and have them kind of upright, okay? Babies who are premature for breathing do better if they're up, if they're up like this, okay? Okay, so if the mother can 
keep them up like this, she's doing better. I, uh, one of the uh, times that I did a set of twins that I didn't know it was twins, it really wasn't my client. I was helping someone else do it, but I didn't know it was twins. And it was a real interesting thing. I did have the twins took them to the hospital because they did have some respiratory problems. They were a little young, but this is an interesting experience with them, okay? So there's two babies. So dad has one and mom has the other one up against her chest. And the one up against the mom's chest was breathing just fine, no problem. The one that dad was holding started to have respiratory uh, flaring of the nostrils and some of the other things. So we switched them, took the baby that was next to mom over to dad, okay, and gave the one that was dad to the mother. Immediately the baby started breathing right and good, okay, and we did this several, you know, several times. And uh, it's really interesting how being next to the mother, okay, and we call that kangaroo care is what they, they call it wrapping the baby in because they can nurse when they want to. It's all right there, and uh, and it's wonderful. You, that's what you need to do. And you know the old stories about the pioneer times when the premature babies were put in shoe boxes and put by the war warmer part of the the uh, stove, and the grandmummies sat there and took care of them. Okay, you've got to keep them warm. Temperature is extremely important in all babies. We talked about if a baby loses temperature, then it'll stop breathing. It'll have bre breathing problems. But it's either too hot or too cold. Like with a premature baby, you've just got to keep them at a good body temperature because if it's too hot, they have to spend calories to regulate their temperature, and that does not work, okay? Uh, they just don't have that many calories to, to, uh, <coughs> to spend. This is an important thing. Second twin, okay? So the first one is out, and so there's a lot of room in the abdomen, the mother's abdomen. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna hold the abdomen tight on the sides, okay? because you want that baby to be up and down and come in. And if the baby is transverse, the second baby is transverse, you got lots of room to turn it from the outside. Mm -hmm. So you try, you know, try to turn the baby and get it up and down. Sitting the mom on the toilet is a good way to get the baby to come down and out. Now, I had an experience with a set of twins. I got called to go up to, to Logan, okay, to a set of twins were being born. And um, I was not the midwife in charge. And, you know, midwife protocol is uh, keep your mouth shut <laughs> unless you're asked to contribute. <laughs> and so, you know, I, every, so the first twin was born and then, you know, her body had had the baby, that was it. She just stopped contracting. Women may not contract anymore. The, the body thinks it's done its job. Okay, after all, it did get a baby out. Well, I kept seeing this and that, okay. Every once in a while I said, you know, uh, it, it would be good to make sure this baby is aligned and whatever. She wasn't hemorrhaging or anything like that, so she wasn't bleeding. So, about an hour, and they decided that it was all emotional. Okay, now this is really an important thing. You know, emotions do affect labor, okay? Very definitely. And you can have a woman that is stubborn and wants something done and she can make sure it's done, but not always. Always look for the physical reason of something that's going on. Always look to the physical. You can treat the emotional and talk to her about emotional too, but don't neglect the physical. So I thought after a while, oh, you know, you ought, after an hour or so, I said, you know, don't you think you ought to go to the bathroom? That might be a good idea. 
She says, yeah. So I went into the bathroom with her and closed the door, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sat her on the toilet and told her to push. Hmm, sure enough, here comes the second twin. I, I was real respectful. I got her up when it was coming down, walked her into the other room, and they had thought it was all emotional that she was not. But it was just that the baby wasn't down quite far enough and it wasn't giving her any urge to push. So look for the physical thing. Now, then I went downstairs after the babies were born and then I was down there relaxing, eating something and trying to take a little nap and they came running, Diane, Diane, she's hemorrhaging. Well, women who carry twins hemorrhage more. You always need to, to know that because they are so pendulous, they're so big, okay, that they just, uh, you know, and just think of all the placental site, okay? You got two placentas or one huge one stuck in there and think of all the ways that this uh, bleeding could occur, okay? So I went up and this lady was herbalist, a very good herbalist, okay? And she was giving uh, shepherd's purse and cayenne and all those things, but I got really angry inside myself, although I was very nice, okay, is that the first thing you do, what do you do when the woman is bleeding? You grab that uterus and you push it down. You get that placental site smaller, okay? So I went up there. Now the herbs are wonderful and I love them. And I love them for hemorrhage too, but what you do is grab the uterus and hold it down. Then you have someone else start giving them the herbs. You don't do that first. You push down on the uterus. And that's the same if you're carrying pit or any other drug. You push down on that uterus first and then you give a shot, okay? That is number one. Don't ever forget that, okay? <laughs> and you will do fine. Now, I did not say when we were talking about hemorrhage how much blood loss is a hemorrhage, okay? And I'm going to put this in cups, okay? Because that's the way I learned it. I don't equate to all the, the um, uh, medical terminology as far as if it's, if, but cups make sense to me, if you know what I mean. Two and a half cups is a hemorrhage two and a half cups, and you get a great big clot. You could have one clot be a cup, okay? So if you're losing more than that, then you need to be really careful. But twin mothers, you have always got to get in there and pull down their uterus and bind their stomachs, okay? That's good. Let me show you a little binder <coughs> that you can make, okay? <laughs> now, if you take a piece of uh, cotton cloth, okay, about like this, strips of it, okay, and you make it wide enough so that it can go around the waist, okay, around here, and you put uh, the same thing down, but make it long enough that it can go under and up, what you do is you take it around the middle, and then you put it under there. You put a pad or, you know, a baby diaper or something else, and you take a safety pin, a, a diaper pin, okay, and pin it all together in the front, and it actually holds the uterus in. Even if you have, a, like, an ACE bandage, okay, if you, you should really carry one, okay? Stick it and wrap it around the the uterus and help hold it in and down. That really helps to cut down blood loss afterwards, okay? Would you say to put a pad under that? Yeah, you could put a pad in it, like a, a baby diaper works great, okay? Yes? Um, I just want to say about the two and a half cups. My midwife told us to dye some water, two and a half cups of water, and pour it in a chucks pad. She can see what that actually looks like. Yeah, uh, the blood is a little bit thicker and it's hard sometimes to distinguish what it is, but if you're out on a birth with someone that is really experienced and knows, 
then you figure out in your mind, oh, well, I think she lost about, you know, a cup and a half. Then you ask whoever is there, the person that is experienced, how much blood? And that's how you learn. And she'd say, oh, yeah, it was about a cup and a half. And you say, mm-hmm. Or, no, I thought it was two cups. So then you can start to judge and whatever. But you've got amniotic fluid sometime mixed with the blood and all sorts of things. But um, in other words, just be eagle eyes and be watching these things as to what needs to be done. Yeah? Mom, did you say that you want to get the second one out? Right. The second one I want out. Okay, so I'm going to hold it like this, hold her uterus and have her push and get the baby started. Now, I have heard of people waiting for the next day, you know, one twin come out and then they wait a day for the next one. That puts her in labor a second time. And it, I think it leaves her exposed for bleeding more. Um, and, and so when she actually gives birth to the second baby, it's going to be harder to stop the bleed. As I say, it's possible. Anything's possible. <coughs> Just remember that, OK? But um, I have had some difficulties with mothers with twins getting them to push the second baby out. In other words, you need to really monitor if you've got a nurse there or someone that can check heart tones, the second one is going to go down. And like one woman, she was just really tired. She'd push the baby out, the first baby out, and she didn't have any energy, she thought. And it was before I had a birth stool, I took her into the bathroom, and I literally put my face in hers and I <laughs> shouted to her to get the baby out because that second baby was in trouble, okay? So it isn't any time to say, well, I'm tired. <laughs> I can't push, do you know what I mean? You gotta do it. Did you have a comment? Yeah. Our twin had a comment. <laughs> I was gonna say, so I have a twin brother and we were conceived at different times, so I was a week ahead in development. And so <laughs> we were, I, he was born five weeks early, I was born four weeks early. But in the case with my mom, she was exhausted after all the labor and she's a small little thing. And so basically the doctors, I was lined up ready to go for a long time, but they said he was hanging back like, and not in line and kind of didn't want to come out and he pushed himself to a corner. And so basically they told her, well, my mom said the doctor told the nurse, as soon as that baby comes out, you pointing to one nurse, you're going to push that baby to the front, to the middle of the, the belly, and then you, you're going to push it from the top down. And so he was born two minutes later. Mm -hmm. But he had trouble breathing. His lungs weren't developed completely. Because he was younger. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so amazing. was. In her case, she couldn't push any further. She was just exhausted. And so yeah. the doctor was like, but they, you push and then They you worked push and, and then did some funnel out. pressure and got the baby yeah. out. <clears throat> Good doctor. Uh, just a comment, okay, about women during pregnancy. Women can um, conceive twins and miscarry one and carry the second twin. And uh, let's say this scenario, she makes it to 20 weeks and goes into labor, okay? Um, if, if one twin is born and she stops labor, then that's the way it should be. In other words, if you can hold the second one in there. So don't try to stimulate a lady like that to give birth at that gestation. You just want to help her to continue with the pregnancy. Okay, let's go to breaches. Um, in an emergency situa situation, you're gonna run into a breach, whether you like it or not, okay? I'd say about one in every 50 babies is born breech. Now, are, I mean, would be born breech if they were all done naturally, okay? And you're gonna walk in somewhere, even if you're not supposed to deliver them, and the lady's pushing them. A little butt is coming out. Well, you know, I'm not gonna transport a lady at that time. I'm gonna deliver her, of course. Oh, and I had a lady once who had, um, uh, this was, uh, maybe your fifth or sixth baby, okay? And her water broke, 
I know that it was head down to begin with because I felt the sutures and, <laughs> and had checked everything. I, I knew where it was. And her water broke and the baby flipped to breach. She says, you know, I think I'm, my baby's flipped. And she was about ready to push. She'd, her water had broken and so forth. And she did just fine with it. It was a 10 pound baby. And <coughs> she did a fine job with it. I said, hey, this is really, this is really unusual. It'll never happen again. <laughs> Well, next time she was pregnant, she called me and she says, I'm in labor, but you know, I think my baby flipped last night. <laughs> sure enough, it was breach again. So anyway, that kind of happens. The thing that you need to remember with a breach is that you may have other problems that come with it, okay? The baby may have some congenital problems. It may, may have... Uh, there may be a reason to be breech. Um, I remember helping uh, someone with a breech delivery, uh, another midwife, okay? And the mother, breech deliveries can be hard, and especially if women are used to head downs, and you saw it was hard for those women. If they're used to head down babies, breech babies are harder to push out, takes longer, et cetera. Uh, but we set her on the toilet and got the baby out. It was, a, we didn't know that it was breached to begin with, but we figured it out. And we had to resuscitate the baby. We resuscitated the baby. Uh, but then the baby started breathing and uh, was okay. It was kind of a small baby. Um, the kids, it was a big family. The kids came in, all said good night to the baby, went to bed. And as soon as the children left the room, there was a bunch of uh, pink bubbles coming out of the baby's nose, okay. So I called the ambulance and the baby was dead before they got there. Um, and took the baby in the next day for an autopsy for them to check. And they couldn't believe that we even got the baby started in the beginning, that it had anomalies in the heart and so forth, okay, in the circulatory system. And so you are more likely to find this in breech babies. Uh, so <laughs> kind of expect that. Oh, you, I, uh, you know, I must admit, I did a first time mother in Midway with an eight pound breech baby one time. And she was up on that mountain, up out there on the side, okay? And um, delivered her. And the thing that made me angry was that she told people that she had had a breach and delivered it. And the rumor was that the baby was, there was something wrong with the baby that he, he didn't have uh, as good an intellect or whatever, that he was brain damaged from being, a breach baby, and oh, it wasn't true at all. You just can't believe everything you hear, okay? <laughs> well, anyway, I need to tell you how to deliver a breach. My favorite way, the way I love to do a breach, okay? And breaches can be so easy, you just can't believe it, okay? And breaches can be so hard that you are praying every single second, and you do not know which it is going to be when you start out. You just have to wait and see. <coughs> One time I had a, a little couple at BYU that uh, they, I went over, they were in labor, and I determined that the baby was breached. So I took them into a local doctor and I said, I want you to tell him what you can do for him. And he, the only thing he could do is take him into the hospital and C-section him. And they said they didn't want to do it. And he tried to turn the baby, and I tried to turn the baby externally on the outside, and it didn't work either time. So I figured, oh, the baby is breached for a reason. Well, it was breached for a reason. Th when the baby came, oh, then I went to sleep on the couch, okay? Well, she didn't seem like she was doing much. And about an hour later, she woke me up. Oh, I feel like I have to push. <laughs> and so she pushed the baby out. And 
the, there was th a cord three times around the neck, okay? So the cord was short, and that's why the baby was breached, for a reason, it was fine. But there was a reason, and it was just the environment that the, the baby was in. Uh, okay, well this is my favorite way, okay? Um, breaches are gonna come out in through the side, okay? And you're gonna see their little butt, and there's gonna be a little bit of poop that comes out of it. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> you say, oh my, this looks like a breach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the baby is coming and comes out like this. Now, you really don't, um, well, maybe I should tell you what position. When <laughs> I know it's a breach or when it is, I put the mother on the, the, a bed with her butt right next to the e edge of it, okay? The, the edge right here. <coughs> and she's got her legs and so they're kind of dangling. So I put a person on each side of her sitting on the bed holding the leg up, okay? So she's there with the, right at the edge of the bed. And I have her push the baby out in that position. And I am gonna go like this, the baby's gonna go like this. And you do not have to really untangle the legs. You saw that in one video, he did take the legs out. And you see, this is a frank breach, okay? The most common breach with the legs up to the top, okay? So it's gonna be a while before the legs come out, okay? So just let the butt and everything come on out. Now you don't want her, unless it's a really small baby, okay? And those breeches looked kind of small to me. You don't want her to just, to be too upright and push too fast because if you do, if she pushes the baby out too fast or you try to push the baby down, the arms will go up like this and the arms will be on the side of the head and that is the worst thing in the world to get undone. And I'm gonna show you how to do it, okay? But it, it, the baby isn't gonna come out like that, okay? So, and that is the thing. It's the head is the largest part and it comes last, okay? So here you got it and the leaves come out, the legs come out like this. You can just let them, you can put a warm towel around the baby so it isn't stimulated too much and it helps you kind of hold on to it because it is going to be, the baby is going to be slippery, okay? But it is the arms that are the tricky one. So you, the baby comes out this far and you've got the arms like this, okay? And so what you do as a practitioner, <laughs> and you're there, you take your finger over the back of the baby and you pull this arm around. Okay, you go up, around, and pull the arm out. Now this arm is toward the back. This baby has put his arm toward the back. What you do for that baby, this arm, is that you turn the baby in the direction the fingers, the hand is pointing. So you turn like this and you can get it out and sweep it down, okay? So I want you to take your baby and I want you to pass it down and everyone try this arm thingy bob, okay? Sweeping this arm down and then turning the baby this way and pulling it out. So usually one arm is in the back and one arm is in the front like this? Uh -huh. That's how they're folding? The yeah, but it might be both arms in front is probably the most common one, okay? But I want you to know how to get an arm out from the back, okay? So you turn the baby. 
for this arm, up and over the back, sweep it down. Fingers are pointed this way, so we turn it this way. And that pulls his arm out. And it pulls the arm. And then the baby comes out. After you get the arms out, then you take the body and pull it up this way. So it comes out. And the little face will come out through the, the, um, the opening there, okay? So it'll start with the mouth, so the mouth is open. As long as you have the mouth that can breathe, it's okay. I've had breeches that breathe. As soon as the mouth is out, they'll, they'll breathe, and, and that's okay. I have personally had three, <coughs> delivered three breeches myself. Certain women will deliver breeches, okay, uh, more, than, more than normal. But this, I have to tell you, this is very important, okay? An important principle about breech, okay? So the baby is coming out, okay? Do not ever try to deliver the head until the nap of the neck, you see the nap of the neck, okay? You see the hairline. People get really scared because they try to deliver the breech too fast, the baby's head, and they can't do it. It's stuck in there. But if the baby, what you do is you let the baby hang. You let the baby hang, and so it's out here, and you keep your hands off of it. That's why I do it on the side of the bed, because the baby is here, okay, and it, I'm going to hang it, the baby's weight. And what the baby's weight is going to do and why you hang it is it tucks the head down and you get the smallest circumference for the head because it is flexed. And so then you take the body and you go up like this. Now, I had a, a client <coughs> who lived down in um, Boulder, Utah, down in, down in the middle of the thing, and she always came up and I delivered her babies. Well, she went into labor kind of a little earlier than normal, and she was at home, and she didn't really realize she was in labor. She was in her tub on a Sunday, and she says, I'm contracting, Diane. I said, you're in labor. Get on the road. So she got in the road on the road within an hour with her family and the uh, her father-in-law and his wife were in the car behind them with one of their kids. Okay. So I got this call. We're going into Scipio and she's going to have this baby, so we're going to go into the motel. Okay. <laughs> I said, when she gets ready to push. <coughs> Call me on the phone. I'll be on my way down, but call me and I'll talk you through it. So they went into the uh, motel room. Five minutes later, she was standing on the tub. They didn't put water in the tub. She was just there squatting and she started to push. So he got me on the phone and, and they were talk, talking and he says, oh, here comes the hen, the head. Oops. <laughs> It's a butt. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, uh, he said, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, but I can't get the head out. OK, couldn't get the head out. So I said, have her stand up and let the baby hang there. Don't touch the baby. Just let the baby hang. Have her stand, OK? And I said, after she's done that for a, a minute or two, a couple minutes, then have her push the baby again. So after she did that, she squatted down again, and he was able to get the head out. And then I heard this, <laughs> and then a couple minutes later, Diane, the baby stopped breathing. So what do you think I told him to do? I said, put your hand on the, the baby's back, and then on the bottom and fold the baby together a couple times and so that's what he did and of course the baby started crying again was fine the idea of hanging the baby is really important and i got a call from uh 
many years ago from a chiropractor down in Leverkin, okay, whose wife was having a baby and it was coming out and they discovered it was breech. And so the attendant called me and she said, I've got one minute to talk to you. What advice can you give me? I said, if you can't get the head out, have the mother stand. And they couldn't get the head out. And she, they had the mother stand and then they were able to get it. Okay, that weight. That weight of the baby makes the head flex and makes it smaller and then you can deliver the baby that way. Yes. Um, will you talk a little bit about the umbilical cord when all that's going on? What's happening there? And is there any chance of there being pressure <coughs> on the umbilical cord while from the baby? Um, yes, but you can, you can handle it because the head is the last part coming out with the cord around the neck, okay? You can keep the head right there and undo it, okay? It was just like that couple that had the, the little baby with the cord three times around the neck. I kept the baby right there close and undid it, okay, and then brought the baby up on the thing. The cord can, with a breech baby, can slip down, especially if it is a footling breech because there's room for a cord to slip. And so that is one of the problems with footling breeches. Doctors like Frank breeches with their, their, their legs all the way up because it makes us a bigger uh, portion as it comes through to dilate. But also one thing about a Frank breech is it's like a stiff board and you think, how on earth can this baby get out? They'll just come out stiff as a board. But actually that, that stiffness opens up the canal more and makes it so that it's easier to get the head through in the end. And also one thing about a Frank breech, for people, if you have someone there that does take heart tones and knows how to take heart tones on the baby, Frank breeches, because of the way they're folded, rest lower in the mother's abdomen than the other babies, and so the heart tone will be lower. And just generally speaking, with a breech baby, heart tones are gonna be found above the umbilicus, the mother's umbilicus, okay? But with a frank breech, it might be louder above the umbilicus, but you can usually get it below the umbilicus too, and that can trick you, because if you say that breeches only have uh, heart tones, you get them above the umbilicus, that's not quite true. Uh, with the case of, say, triplets, more and more people are doing in vitro, and we're seeing sometimes like those things happen. Would you use just the same principle, and like in an emergency, stuff like this, if there was things that happen like that eventually, would you just use the same principle, or have you ever delivered triplets, or I'm just wondering. You know, I've never delivered triplets. Um, they're not going to show up very much, but you'd, you'd just work on the same, the same principles. Someone is going to have to be there to take care of each one of the babies uh, for a while. That's going to be uh, really hard, but yeah, you, it would be difficult. Yes? In the case of the umbilical cord coming down when the baby um, came out feet first, <coughs> <clears throat> what would you? What do you do in that scenario with the with the umbilical uh, cord? Okay, um, I would put the mother in knee chest position, and I would try to push the cord back up in. That's what I would do, and then I would wait until she's fully dilated, and put her in a position that I could get the baby out fairly fast. I might even have her push in knee chest to start the process of of pushing it out. You just do the best you can. One thing that is very important to remember in an emergency situation, um, uh, we do the best we can. We do the best we can with the skills we have and the information we have and what we know. Uh, one thing that is very disconcerting is that after big disasters, the people who are the caretakers and take care of people 
there usually is quite a bit of suicide afterwards because they feel badly about what they saw or that they couldn't take care of everything. You should never feel like you have to take care of everything. You are not in charge. I can't control birth. I can help and do what I want to, but I cannot control it. I cannot. It is really the Lord who is in charge, and <laughs> I, I can't. So if you think that you have to, you're going to be in trouble because that just is not the case. You do the best you can. You help. You, you work. And if you have a fetal demise, if you have a baby that doesn't make it, you give comfort and love to the parents. Do everything that you can. You, you can't really blame yourself. That is very important. You just have to realize that basic principle. Yes? When you said you have them go into the knee chest position, is that on the delivery stool or is that you put them in bed and have them go to the knee chest position? You can do it on the floor. You can do it on the bed. On the bed. So it's all fours with the head down, actually. So it's just the back, butt up, and the head down. Okay. I was thinking they were bringing their knees up to the chest. I thought when you said head, head chest, knee, uh, chest, I was thinking they were bringing their knees up here to the chest. No, it is uh, knees on the knees with the head down okay. on the ground. Okay, that's good. Thank you for clarifying that. That's really good. Diane, do you happen to have a list of care providers, more doctors that are breach friendly, that will deliver breach babies just for people who aren't maybe comfortable giving birth at home? I don't. I don't know of any. Uh, I would just get on the internet and see if you could find, find it. I know that there are uh, doctors that, I think there are doctors that will do it. I know that there's at least one at the U, but I don't know of any. Yeah, yeah I, think there's, I think there's one at the, the university, University of Utah. Okay, so you know how to you know how to deliver a breech baby. <laughs> <laughs> My sister was breech like that, a friend of breech, and she just had to have surgery last year because of hip dysplasia. Frank breech babies tend to have more problems with hip dysplasia because of the pressure put on their hip joints through that delivery. So not that you're going to be taking care of the baby, but if you happen to have a Frank breech birth, you just might be aware of that. Yeah, I, if you noticed, and you noticed in the picture, after the, the Frank breeches were born, that they couldn't put their legs down. They, they kept trying to put them up, and that's exactly what happens. And uh, breeches, like my Riley, uh, she tended to scoot on the floor, is how she got around. And that is more common with breaches that come through that, that way. I want to read something to you from the Knapsack News. Uh, it's in the 80s, okay? This was really earth shattering to me. Didn't really realize this. Uh, um, they did a study in England and Margaret too is the person who ran the study and what they were comparing was out of hospital births um, with hospital births and they were uh, comparing the outcomes. How, would it, how, how are the outcomes? And they didn't just take low-risk women. They took high-risk women, too, women with problems and so forth. And um, they were really surprised at the outcome, OK? They found that if a woman is high risk, she would have more problems out of hospital. Um, I mean, she'd have more problems, but she would actually have less problems than those that were in the hospital. And as I say, the people who did the research were really shocked. But um, they did 16,000 births and classified them into different categories according to risk. And uh, as I say, 
of course, low-risk mothers, you would expect them to do better, okay, outside of the hospital because of the lack of drugs. And that, that's basically it. But uh, they found that actually high risk, many of the high risk people did better, although they did have problems, okay. I think one thing that is really interesting, it says, I'll read this paragraph. Professor Tu concludes her chapter with the following account. It is appropriate to end this chapter by reporting the outstanding record of one general practitioner who in 30 years practice in the Northeast Great Britain has cared for 5,010 births. He ac accepts women in all risk categories, but attaches great importance to prenatal care. Okay, so what they're doing in the prenatals. Deliveries have been in the mother's home, in nursing homes, and in general practitioner beds in hospital. His careful records show a force-up rate of 2% and only six cesareans, okay, <laughs> a rate of 0.1%. There have been um, 10 perinatal deaths, five in transfer to consultant care, giving a perinatal mortality rate of 2.0. Confinement in his care, two comments, has been a very safe procedure. Okay, so really, in an emergency situation, and you have to take care of really high risk things, okay, really rely on your herbal training and all these things. Get helpers. I don't think we said that you know, have a, someone that does essential oils <laughs> on your team, that would be good, okay, as well as homeopathics, be creative, okay, and do the best you can, okay, you're not going to be able to solve all problems, but you're going to be able to, to help with them, so, um, now, there is, oh, if you have a chiropractor on your team, or if you have one in the neighborhood, <laughs> Uh, there is what is called the Webster's breech turning technique, and you can get your chiropractor to come and work on her. Um, I think we have a handout somewhere. Uh, you don't have it today, but anyway, uh, you can look it on the internet, uh, Webster's breech turning technique. And if you have that in your possession, if a chiropractor is not used to it, okay, you can teach him I mean, give the paper to him and he'll know what to do and it will help to turn a breech baby. There's also pulsatilla. Pulsatilla, I've seen it turn a breech in 24 hours, uh, a nine pound breech, <laughs> okay? Giving that to the mother, um, just uh, energy work, all those kind of things help, okay? Yes? I have a friend who uses um, clay, administers clay on the belly of her mother's. Fantastic. So, you know, find out exactly how she does it. Have her on your list of people to help you. How do you feel about moxibustion? Do you feel like that works? I think uh, I, have, I, have never, I have never used it, but it is, if you do it on the little toes, that turns a breach. And I also have had people use those pressure points just with their fingers and hold them for 30 minutes or so to turn a breach. And that was successful? Yeah, so in other words, it was the same spot on the outside of the little toe.